Yeah, so, so how did you meet him? So how did you meet him? Did you read his work first or did you meet him first? Um, I met him. Well, actually, the the figure who got me cranked up on Jabra was uh, Adnan Haider, who at the time was my colleague, my junior colleague at the University of Pennsylvania. He arrived and um, Jabra had just published his novel uh, Safina. He would published other novels before. And of course, uh, as you probably know, he his English was better than mine uh, and <laughs> his English was absolutely incredible. Right. And, and, you know, he's the translator of Shakespeare's sonnets and the tragedies and even more challenging uh, Faulkner's Sound and Flory. I, I had trouble reading that, you know, because of all the colloquialisms and stuff. Um, but um, he he'd written this novel, the Safina, and Adnan had read it and said, this is really terrific. And he got in touch with Jabra and Jabra was in the process of coming to the States at that point. I don't know if I sent it to you. I have a picture of Jabra, Adnan and myself in the Waldorf Astoria. Oh, there it is. That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It. Uh, and that's where we were talking about translating Safina. Mm. And we translated it and um, Jabra wrote to us and said, I like your translation better than my original. Because you've two got separate voices and you've each taken one of the two major characters. There is a third character who has one section, but the, the, the two major, I took Wadi Asaf and he took uh, Sam. And inevitably, as two translators, from two separate cultures. The the first translation you do reflects precisely your own background. Of course, Adnan and I then swapped each with each other and went through it. But he said, you're able in the translation to give indeed separate voices to the English text that I couldn't do in the Arabic because I'm writing in Arabic and I'm writing in Arabic. And it doesn't matter which character I'm writing about. So that was the start. Of course, then uh, George Bush had his fun invasion of Iraq, right? And mm. uh, Jabra was basically confined to his house um, while he was there, you know, with Tomahawk missiles and all sorts of stuff coming down. And um, we corresponded by cassette tape. <laughs> and that's what a lot, but also with letters. He wrote me letters which were published in this journal, Jasur. Um, but the one thing is, you know, I'm, uh, I was for 25 years organist and choir master of the Episcopal Church on the Penn campus. Jabra loves classical music and he mm. loves above all, he loved early classical music. So I sent him recordings of me playing Bach and my choir singing Bach and Purcell and all these people. And he loved it. And he wrote to me when we decided to translate the next novel, Al-Bahth and Walid Mas'ud, in search of Walid Mas'ud. He wrote to me and said, oh, by the way, Roger, you sent me that recording you made of Purcell's harpsichord suite, uh, blah, 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 blah. It's on page 63 of the novel. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, You're, you now have a presence of one of my novels. So I said, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> but, so on your pen, on the pen website, it uh, it talks about many of the authors who you've translated. Yes. But there's a parenthetical after Jabra Ibrahim Jabra that says with whom he worked closely or something to that mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. So why? Why does it say, you know, that for him versus other authors? What was different about that relationship? That Jabra was constantly in touch with us mm. about translating his works. I mean, he would always write and saying, you're the translators. I wrote this. Here are some suggestions. And here's this text with <laughs> covered <laughs> in ideas. Uh, many of which were very good. But, you know, occasionally I said, no, I don't like that. He said, you're the translator. Go ahead with it. But I don't think I can say this for sure. There's no other Arab author who I've translated 
who has who was so interested in and involved in the translation process itself. Um, they've all, you know, they've all been very happy that I'm translating them and they've welcomed the translation, but they haven't actually been involved in the process of transferring the text from one language to a, and culture to another the way he was. Mm -hmm. And of course, he is uniquely qualified to do precisely that. Right. His his early books interest were in English and then he moved to writing in Arabic. That's right. That's right. Um, and the translations of his early novels are not by him. <laughs> you know, they're all available in Arabic now, but, you know, uh, w w cry on a, I can't remember the titles now, but there are, I think, th two or three of them. I think three, yeah. The, o the other colossally important uh, thing about Jabra, as far as I was concerned, was in 1988, after the war was over, um, I went, along with Salma Jayusi, to the Mirbad Festival in Baghdad, organized by, guess who, Mohsen al Musawi, who'd just been released from jail to organize the conference, his mm -hmm. brother having been assassinated by Saddam Hussein. But that's where I met Mohsen, and I remember vividly, I arrived, we arrived from London on Iraq Airlines at Baghdad Airport, and we were met by Ibrahim Samarai and all sorts of people, taken to the hotel, etc., etc., etc. And um, the opening ceremony was the very next morning for the festival. And we all showed up, and all these poets got up and recited these odes in praise of Saddam Hussein. Unbelievably, there was. Um, um, Suad Sabah from Kuwait. There was a Sudanese poet, Nizar Qabani, recited a poem in praise of Saddam. And then this Iraqi poet, uh, Abdul Wahid Abdul Razak, got up and started re re reciting this ode. Well, Jabbar was sitting next to me, and at some point, <laughs> I'll tell you why later. I fell asleep because I, I was drunk, <laughs> and I'm sitting there at this you note know, with my head in my arms asleep. Jabra, so and so, got up and took a photograph of me, sound asleep, and sent it to me, saying, "Roger Allen at line 56 of." <laughs> anyway, so he did that, but then. Oh, and the other person that was there, uh, who I got to know at this conference, was Alain Robrier, who was invited by the Iraqis along with his wife. And he latched onto me very quickly because I speak French too. And he wanted to know, what the heck's going on? And why are we listening to all this stuff? Mm. <laughs> and his wife was very naughty and um, got me to take some pictures of Alain Robrier standing in front of a statue of Saddam Hussein and all that stuff. But anyway, uh, that the second evening, Jabra said to me after we'd listened to God knows how many lines, hours of poetry, he said, have you had enough? And I said, yes. He said, let's go home. So I went to his house mm. in Al Mansur and I got to meet uh, his wife and was able to see his incredible collections in this house primary of interest to me, because he put them on, hundreds of LPs. So I, I said, now I know why there's all this. He said, oh yeah, I've got my own LPs, but you know, I enjoyed getting some fresh stuff from you. Um, painting, some of them by himself. And books, oh my God. And we had a wonderful evening together talking about a variety of things. And what really shattered me was a few years later, the late and wonderful Anthony Shadid, I don't know if you know him, the correspondent of the New York Times. Yes. Who died right on the Syrian border there. He emailed me and said, Roger, I don't know if you know this. They've just destroyed Jabra's house because they thought it was the Egyptian embassy. So they blew up his house and everything in it, and all those treasures which were in there were lost, which is 
terribly sad. But I can never forget that. Well, being in Baghdad with Jabra, but also <laughs> these various naughty little side things which happened. <laughs> so, have you had enough? Well, the answer is yes, more than enough. And so we went to his house, had a wonderful meal with his wife and discussed all sorts of stuff. So he, he, he was a very important uh, figure in my, my life uh, as a translator, but as a specialist on Arabic, yes. So uh, I, was, I was curious, you mentioned how he said uh, he, he appreciated how with the co-translator um, working with Adnan, you, you had two very distinct voices in the English. Yes. And and then I think you you had said in a, in an essay on translation that that he had he had said that then he had gone on and he had recreated something like that in a in his collaboration with Munif, uh, the world without yes. maps. Oh yes. So do you did his experience of the translation process then influence his creative process? Uh, I don't think so. Um, Again, I have another story uh, because he introduced me to Monif, and as you know, I, uh, probably I, I, I have a huge correspondence in Arabic with Monif mm. involving the writing of uh, Cities of Soul. Uh, the fact that right. it started as a trilogy. I don't know if you know this. It started as a trilogy. He was in Boulogne at the time in France. Uh, and he wrote to me about it. And then Peter Theroux got in touch with me and said, I want to translate this new work of Monif because I'd already translated uh, endings. And um, so I wrote to Monif and he wrote back to me and said, yes, that's fine. Peter Theroux signed a contract with Random House. Moved to one year later, Monif writes to me and says, um, I have a confession to make. It's a quintet. <laughs> it's, it's a quintet. So I immediately wrote to Peter Theroux said it's a quintet. Peter Theroux wrote to Random House and said it's a quintet. Random House said, sorry, we've signed the contract. We're not doing the other two. But anyway, the point is, uh, Jabra was the force who encouraged Munif with a PhD in oil economics and a role also, you know, I don't know, J Jabra was the artistic advisor to the Iraq Petroleum Company. Did you know that? I did not. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what that meant. But anyway, Munif's working for the Iraq Petroleum Company. And Jabra says to Munif, you know, you should, you should start writing. So guess what? He did. But when Anbal uh, Akharayat uh, came out, they both wrote to me and sent me an extract and said, guess who wrote what? And I wrote back and said, well, uh. it's the obvious, uh, who wrote what? And they said, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> they were so happy that I got it wrong. In other words, I don't know if they were both imitating each other or what, but uh, anyway. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't think there's any necessary linkage between those two. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, they both enjoyed having fun at my expense. <laughs> so you've translated both collaboratively, as you did with uh, the two Jabrahim and Ibrahim Jabra books, and uh, the Munif book you translated simply Myself. on your own, many yep. other books. Yeah. Um, when do you choose that you want to translate collaboratively and how is that, what, what are the upsides and the downsides to that? Well. I mean, as I say, it was Adnan who uh, had met Jabra before I did and basically said, look, uh, we're in the same building, you know, we see each other every day. Why don't we? And here's this novel, which is a novel of voices, primarily two mm -hmm. voices. So why don't we translate it? You know, it, it was his idea. And then, of course, we went on um, with Al-Bahth and Walid Mas'ud. Um, I mean, that's 12 voices. So we took six each, literally. 
I mean, I mm. think he did one, th one, three, five, seven, you know, and I did two, four. That's how we did it. I mean, it's just, just as basic as that. And, um, of course, the very first translation of modern Arabic literature I did was the collection of stories by Mahfouz, which is mentioned mm. by the Nobel Committee, God's World. Okay. That was mm. done again. So, you see, it's, there's an interesting difference because I've worked in, on this project, Memoir de la Méditerranée, with um, Hartmut Fendrich and a whole load of European colleagues at the Escuela de Traductores in Toledo. By the way, I don't, have you met Gonzalo Parilla Fernandez? Yes. You have? Mm -hmm. Good. He's, he's a buddy of yeah. mine, you may know. Anyway, um, a, um, there, at least six translators in six different languages all met simultaneously with the author and went through the process of, of analyzing their translations, which they'd already done, with the author in contrast with the other five languages. I did um, mm. Maytail Misani's, uh, what's it called, um, Dunyazad. Um, using that process. So, as I say, but with, with another translator, with Adnan, basically, we particularly with the first chapter of Al-Bahth an Walid Mas'ud, which is a written record of a tape recording. Oh, my God. I mean, we literally sat down and did that together simultaneously at the same table uh, with the others we took separate chapters but with that we couldn't do that we had to sit down but the question is whether you actually sit down with your fellow translator and work together or whether mm. you do it sequentially right and with most of the things i've done it's been sequential in other words somebody is the first translator and then somebody is the second and right. it depends of course, on the w w whether the other trans in every case with me, I think the the other translator has been an a, an original native speaker of Arabic. Mm. So that brings its own advantages, but its own issues. And therefore, you know, my process has sometimes been to what's the word anglicize something which maybe doesn't sound quite right or whatever it is but um as i say translating with another person takes a, a, a whole variety of different form sequences and so on uh i've I, of course i've thoroughly enjoyed them all but um mm -hmm. of course translating on your own is is a is a lonely activity of course but um you know there there um it, there are advantages to that too but it's it's nice to share the experience with somebody else as well. Mm -hmm. So was Jabra like a third partner in in your yes. translations of him? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, as I say, not really a partner, but some a, a commentator on what we'd done, saying, mm -hmm. as I say, uh, obviously we're not going to ignore what, 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 his red ink all over the place, but he made it quite clear that, look, um, this is translation of something that I've written. So I am absolutely not in a position to translate. Uh, I, sure, I can translate from English into Arabic, and I have. But, oh, the one thing I remember he said, he has a poem. Urkudi Urkudi Amuhrati. It's translated, I think, by... Munachori in one of his anthologies, run, run my, what's he called it? Run, run my lovely mare, M-A-R-E. Mm. He told me once, I translated that and it was an unmitigated disaster. I hate it. So he said, he said, that made it clear to me that I can't and shouldn't translate from Arabic into English, particularly mm. something I've written myself. That's another memory I have, something he explained to right. me talking about translation. 
Right. Did he? He didn't explain why he felt it was an, a disaster. Well, you know, he said, I, I conceived this and wrote it in Arabic. And I can't conceive and write it in the same way in English mm. because it's not in Arabic. And I can't, I can pedantically transfer the images from one to the other, but it doesn't read. To me, mm. it doesn't read the same in English as it does in Arabic, and the English doesn't work as well as the Arabic does. Well, I mean, it's obvious, you know, since it's, it's a creation of his in Arabic, that's that's to be expected. Right. And he he never like talked to you, consulted you about his translations into into Arabic from oh, English. No, 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 I mean. No, I mean, they they were all published and widely recognized in the Arab world for what they are. I mean, uh, my supervisor, Mustafa Badawi, translated some Shakespeare into Arabic, too. And uh, he said Jabra's translations, uh, they're, they're, they're the tragedies, but also the sonnets into Arabic mm. poetry. I mean, he, I mean, that's really something. Right. I don't know if well, you've seen yet. Do you know... Um, there's a work by the 18th century Syrian writer Ahmad Shidiak called One Leg Over Another. Yes, of course. Mind-bogglingly, Humphrey Davis has just translated that into English, but it, into English poetic prose. It's absolutely astonishing. Yes. Anyway. So, so, so you feel that those are similar accomplishments, the... Um, Jabri Ibrahim Jabra's uh, translation of Shakespeare and uh, Humphrey's translation of Shidyak into English? Yes, in a way, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you see, they convey, I mean, translation can be very literal. But if you're translating mm -hmm. literature, you have to do more than simply translate one set of words in one language into another set of words into another language. The result has to be literary. It has to sound like literature. And um, I think in each case, that transfer process has been incredibly well done. Mm. So uh, to move off Jabra just for a minute, are, is there something you're working on now? Or are you uh, not working on any translation projects yes. at the moment? Um, a variety of things. My translation mm. of an early novel, Moroccan novel, has come out in London called... Um, well, the original is the Fan al Mahdi. It's by a major Moroccan figure who, who died recently, Abdul Karim Ghalab. Mm -hmm. And it's a very early Moroccan novel. It's 1963. Uh, it's, uh, it's published by House in London. It's called We've Buried the Past. So that's one thing. I've been working closely for a, well over a year now with Mayri Hani, uh, who is the has retired now as director of the Khalil Gibran Center at the University of Maryland. Mm. He hosted a conference on Gibran in, uh, well, firstly, there was one in um, Washington at the Library of Congress. Then a couple of years ago, there was one at the American University in Beirut, which I also attended. But she brought to my attention a work by her uncle, Amin Rihani, mm. called Qalb Lubnan. Heart of Lebanon, which is a set of travelogues that he wrote when he went back to Lebanon after so many decades in America. And he decided that he wanted to retrace his knowledge of the Lebanese mountains and their villages and monasteries and lakes and rivers and valleys and so on. And he has this wonderful series of journeys that he undertakes. He takes, undertakes eight journeys. I've translated that. That's coming out from Syracuse um, oh, in November. Right. And most recently, my colleague, mm. Michael Beard, um, wrote to me and said, have you read this new novel by Reem Basuni? Mm -hmm. Reem, the Mamluk uh, trilogy. Uh, sorry? The Mamluk one. Yes. I've, I've translated that. Uh, oh. It's finished. Um, and um, it's finished and 
Michael is reading it, it's complicated because Michael's one of the two, with Adnan, is one of the two advisors to the Syracuse Middle East Translation Project. So he recommended this to me, wrote to Reem, who sent me a copy of it, which I've now translated, and Michael's now reading it, but I've just sent it to Syracuse, uh, you know, saying uh, this is slightly unusual because what you would normally do now is send this to Michael and Adnan to read. But I just wanted to let you know they're the ones who told me to translate it in the first place. So I don't know where we go from that. But but anyway, they have it. So that's uh, that's the latest thing. I've got um, a couple of things in the wings, one of which annoyingly I haven't been able to find anybody to publish. Uh, Ahmed Tawfiq. Mm -hmm. The minister, um, who, as I say, I know very well, has written now two volumes of his childhood autobiography. And what fascinates me is he wrote he wrote them in the third person. Mm -hmm. I've translated the first one wh where where it's, it's very clear and he makes it very clear. He's an absolutely spoiled brat. <laughs> and, um, but. He lives, I don't know if you've been down there yet, he lives south of Marrakesh, mm. over the Atlas, in a, 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 a town, a city, no, it's not a city, it's really a village, called Imargen. Mm -hmm. It's on the southern slope of the Atlas, and he, it's called Father and What of Son, which is a quote from the Quran, mm -hmm. and um, he, he describes his childhood he describes living at home with a large family. He describes going to the Quran school. But then he describes the fact his father learns about this uh, new French madrasa in the mm. next village. And everybody's outraged because he decides he's going to send his son to this madrasa. So the son goes to the madrasa and it takes him all the way up to 1956 when Muhammad V returns to, mm. to Morocco. But I've, I've had, I don't know why, but nobody seems to be interested. I think the word which kills it off is autobiography. Mm. But I keep trying to point out that this is really like Taha Hussein's The Days. You know, it's, it's a third person narrative and it reads very much like a work of fiction with this bratty boy going around uh, annoying his, his... Maybe you need to call it memoir. Well, yeah, I, 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 the, I mean, Syracuse didn't want it. The American University Press didn't want it. You know, and uh, Saki didn't want it and Internet didn't want it. You know, and that's my normal repertoire. But I may have a lead now in with Yale University Press. I don't know. I'm, I'm currently reviewing I don't know if you know um, Jonas Al Busti, Busti, who is at Yale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he's translated uh, Majnun Al Ward uh, by uh, Shukri, mm -hmm. and I'm cur currently, <coughs> excuse me, currently writing the foreword to that. So I'm reading his translation, but that's just the foreword to somebody else. I'm not actually. I'm not doing any translation right now, but but. Um, I, I seem to be doing a lot of writing for and about other people's stuff. <laughs> anyway. But it seems like a lot of your projects like like Jabra and others have come through personal relationships. Yes, I, I say somewhere I have never translated any Arab author with whom I'm not personally acquainted. Mm. That's, you know, uh, Mahfouz, Yusuf Idris, uh, Hamish, Hanan Sheikh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on and on and on. My tell me, Sani. Uh, yes, the only one I say who, with whom I didn't have a relationship was Muhammad Al Muelhe, right? Who I started with because he died in 1930. Yes. But even there, I was in touch with his family. Mm. Um, he has a nephew who lives in Vienna, and you know. I met him in Paris at a conference about the Moelhays and because a, a, fr a French student did her PhD at Inalco with me on Moelhay, Ibrahim al the father. 
and I'm still in touch with her. But Muelah is the only one who I haven't actually known personally. Yeah. Is that an important part of the translation process? To Not be... necessarily. It's just that um, that's that's just the way it's happened. Uh, mm. You know, well, Jabras led to Munif. Of course, I met Mahfouz for the first time in Cairo while I'm working on Muelahi. And Magdi mm -hmm. who was then the Minister of State for Culture, asked me one day, do you want to meet Mahfouz? And I said, are you kidding? Yes. <laughs> so I, I went to his office. He was the, um, what is he? The, he was the in charge of the censorship of Egyptian movies. And lots of authors, including Yusuf Idris and Abdul Qudus, told me, you know, Mahfouz is the worst possible person to be censored because he's really, he looked at everything and he was very strict. <laughs> well, I went into his office, which was completely closed off and shuttered because of his eyesight. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, he said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm writing a dissertation on Moelhe. And he said, Moelhe? I love Moelhe. I had to memorize a lot of his stuff when I was young. So I spent half this darn interview talking about Moelhe when I wanted to talk about him. But mm -hmm. eventually we got round to him and he, he actually asked me, I still have this in my files. He asked me, would you like to translate some of my stuff? And I said, yeah. He said, well, just make a list and I'll sign it. And he did. 